Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2024. Yes, and welcome to lesson number 10 in the series of Sabbath School lessons on the book of John, written by Edward Zinke and Thomas R. Shepherd. This week's lesson is titled, The Way, the Truth and the Life, and is ready for teaching on December 7. I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, November 30. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus, the way, the truth and the life, is the one that we follow, the one who provides our salvation, the one who comes from heaven to spend time on earth as a baby and grow to be a man and then give his life for each one of us. We just thank you so much for that. And this week, as we study this lesson, we pray that our hearts may be warmed and that our hearts may be changed and that we may know that Jesus is not just our Saviour, but he is our closest friend. We pray that you'll be with us. May your Holy Spirit guide us and bless us. But also today I'd like to pray for Lystra, for Doreen and a regular listener and her family, for Judith Maguda and her family, and leaders of our church in each union and division of the church, and particularly at local conference and local mission level, Lord. Wherever our church administrators are working, we pray that they may be guided by you, that your word will come to fruition, in that Jesus will come, and that he will come soon. We pray that as we open your word now, that each of us may be ready for the infilling of your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is John chapter 1 and verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Let's read that again, John 1 verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. The Gospel of John is divided into four main sections. The prologue, taking up the first 18 verses. The book of signs, going from John 1.19 to John 12.50. The book of glory, from John 13.1 to John 20, verse 31. And then the epilogue, John 21, verses 1 to 25. Our study so far has focused mainly on the prologue and the book of signs, laying out who Jesus is via his miracles, signs, dialogues and teachings. The lessons now shift particularly to the third section of the book of John, the book of glory. Interestingly, the famous seven I am statements form a bridge across the book of signs and the book of glory. These are the bread of life in John 6, 35, 41, 48 and 51, the light of the world in John 8, verses 12 and John 9, verse 5, the door in John 10, verses 7 and 9, the good shepherd in John 10, verses 11 and 14, the resurrection and the life in chapter 11, verse 25, the way, the truth and the life in John 14, verse 6, and the true vine in chapter 15, verses 1 and 5. This week's lesson will begin with the purpose of the farewell discourse and its introduction with the significant episode of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Then it will turn to the I Am statement in chapter 14, I Am the Way, the Truth and the Life. Sunday, December 1. I have given you an example. The farewell discourse of John 13 to 17 provides instruction for Jesus' disciples concerning the future. Its literary pattern is similar to Moses' farewell in Deuteronomy or Jacob's blessing his children in Genesis 47 to 49 or David's instruction 
to Solomon in 1 Chronicles 28 and 29. Jesus consoles his disciples regarding his departure. He promises a surrogate to represent him, the Holy Spirit, in John chapter 14 to 16. He predicts grief to come in chapters 15 and 16. And he exhorts the disciples to stay faithful in chapter 15. Read John 13, verses 1 to 20. What happened here? And why is this story so important? What lessons did Jesus seek to teach? John chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Iscimon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, You have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, He put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I am not referring to you all. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. In that part of the world, in Jesus' day, people wore sandals or were barefoot. The feet would become dusty and dirty. It was a custom for a servant or slave to wash the feet of those coming to a meal. But no servant was present for this function on the night Jesus ate his last meal with his disciples before his arrest. To everyone's surprise, Jesus himself arose from the supper and washed all of their feet. John 13 verses 4 and 5 tells Jesus' actions step by step. Let's read them again. So... He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. It is told in such detail to emphasize the Master's doing this unbelievable act of humility. By telling about Peter's response in verses 8 to 11, deepens the sense of dismay and incomprehension of the disciples at Jesus' actions. Let's read that. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, 
Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet, their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. How could Jesus, the Master, the Messiah, be doing such a lowly task? Peter refused to allow Jesus to wash his feet, only to be told by Jesus that if he did not cooperate, he would have no part with Jesus. Then Peter asked for more, expressing his desire to be connected with Jesus all the way. The significance of Jesus' action is tied to who he is. He states in John 13.13 13, that he is the teacher and the Lord. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. That is what they called him, and he indicates that it is so. These titles express authority and power. Yet, Jesus teaches that power and authority are to be used for service, not for self-aggrandizement. The Adventist Church has embraced this sense of Jesus' example, taking what is rightly called the Ordinance of Humility as a preparatory service for the Lord's Supper. And so to finish the day, what does the Ordinance of Humility teach you about following in the footsteps of Jesus and how to humbly serve others? Monday, December 2. I will certainly come again. Read John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. In what context did Jesus say these words? John 14, beginning at verse 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. At the end of John 13, Jesus says that he is going away. In verse 33, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You can look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. This elicits from Peter, a query about where he is going in verse 36. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. The disciples do not understand that Jesus is talking about his death, resurrection and ascension. Peter says he is ready to lay down his life for him in verse 37. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. This is when Jesus predicts Peter's denial in verse 38. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. It is in this context that Jesus tells his disciples not to let their hearts be troubled. In verse 1 of John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. The verb troubled is translated in Greek as tarasso, which means to stir up or disturb or unsettle or throw into confusion. It is not surprising that the disciples would be thrown into confusion at Jesus' words. But, countering their fears, he talks about his father's house, where there are many rooms, not mansions, but rooms as in an inn. He is going there to prepare a place for them. His words look beyond the coming storm of the cross to the time when he will return to redeem his people. He is looking to the time when this whole tragedy with sin is finished once and for all. As you read in Daniel chapter 7 verse 27, Then the sovereignty, power and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey him. Jesus says, if I go, 
I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, in John 14, verse 3. It is clearly a promise of his second coming. What is the basis for confidence in that promise? Many would say, the fulfilment of Bible prophecy, and that is certainly true. But in John 14, verse 3, the basis is stated differently. In this verse, I will come, is actually in the present tense in Greek, meaning I am coming. This is a use of the present tense in Greek called the futuristic presence. It is a future event spoken of with such certainty that it is described as though already happening. Thus, it is fair to translate the phrase as I will certainly come again. The basis of our hope in the return of our Lord is not simply the fulfilment of Bible prophecy. It is also, and more certainly, based on our confidence in the man who made the promise. He said he will certainly return for his people. We can place our confidence in that promise because of who made it. And so to finish today, what does the Christ teach us about the certainty of Christ's second coming? Without the second coming, what good did Jesus' death do us at the first coming? Tuesday, December 3. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Read John chapter 14, verses 5 and 6. What query did Thomas make about where Jesus was going? And how did Jesus respond? We read now in John 14, beginning at verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thomas's query seems logical enough. If you do not know where someone is going, how can you know the way to follow that person? Jesus upends the query by indicating that he himself is the way. The way to what? The way to the Father. In the prologue of John 1 verses 1 to 18, the intimate connection between the word Logos, Jesus Christ, and the Father is emphasized. John 1.18 says that the only begotten, better translated here as unique, God is the one who has made the Father known. To make known in this text is the Greek verb exigiomai, meaning to explain, interpret, or exposit. We get the word exegesis from this. It means to bring out the meaning. Thus, Jesus Christ is the link to the Father, the one who explains or interprets the Father to a fallen world. Consequently, He is the way or path to the Father. Without Him, we are limited in our understanding. Read John 14, verses 7 to 11. How did Jesus clear up Philip's misunderstanding? John 14, beginning at verse 7. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Philip asked to see the Father, something no sinful human can do and live. And we're going to compare this with Exodus 33, verses 17 to chapter 34, verse 9. 
And so we start at Exodus 33:17. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. The Lord said to Moses, Chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready in the morning, and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is going to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning, as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. Lord, he said, if I have found favour in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. And John 1 verse 18, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Jesus reproves the lack of understanding and points out that if you have seen him, you have seen the Father, in John 14 verse 9. Consequently, it is clear that Jesus is the pathway to God. Without him, the pathway grows dark and uncertain. He is the light that illuminates the way to God. Jesus ties together three terms, way, truth, and life. The term way is used only in John one twenty three regarding John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus, and it is used here in John 14, verse 6. But truth and life are major themes in the gospel. Our study on Wednesday and Thursday will emphasize the concept of truth, a crucial topic, especially in a world where the very idea of truth is called into question. And so to finish today, why is it so comforting to realize that Jesus is the best revelation we will have here of what God the Father is like? Wednesday, December 4. I am the truth. Read John chapter 1, verses 14 and 17, chapter 8, verse 32, chapter 14, verse 6, and John 15, verse 26. How does John tie the concept of truth directly to Jesus? John chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And verse 14, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And John chapter 8, verse 32, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And John 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, 
and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And John 15 verse 26. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Again and again in John's Gospel, truth is connected to Jesus, to his Father, and to the Holy Spirit. Truth is connected with Jesus, the Word, Logos, and with light, in contrast to darkness, as you read in John 1, verses 1 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then John chapter 3, verses 19 and 21. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. And two, falsehood is connected with the devil and sin, as you read in John 8, verses 44 to 46. You belong to your father the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet, because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Consequently, truth in John is not simply a matter of facts and figures. It does involve such things, but more than this. The idea of truth contains a moral aspect of faithfulness to God and to His will. In the book Christ Object Lessons, page 40, we read, There are many who are crying out for the living God, longing for the divine presence. Philosophical theories or literary essays, however brilliant, cannot satisfy the heart. The assertions and inventions of men are of no value. Let the word of God speak to the people. Let those who have heard only traditions and human theories and maxims hear the voice of him whose word can renew the soul unto everlasting life. End of quote. Think about what it means for Jesus to be the truth. Jesus is the Logos, the Word who was with God from the beginning and who was the creator of all things created, which we read in John 1 verses 1 to 4. One with the Father from eternity to eternity. Jesus has the characteristics of the Father and thus is also the I Am. His being is not subject to anyone or anything else. Nothing that exists, including knowledge, exists apart from him. And everything that does exist, 
that was created was created only by Jesus and exists only in him as well. As we read in Colossians 1 verses 16 and 17, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Jesus is not simply the embodiment of the truth. He is the truth. Truth is not a concept or a construct. It is a person. The truth, Jesus Christ, can be likened to the sun that lights up the world, as you read in John eight twelve, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It is parallel to what C.S. Lewis stated about Christianity in Is Theology Poetry, page 15. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. End of quote. It is by Jesus the truth that we are able to interpret the world around us rightly. Thursday, November 5, The Scriptures and the Truth Throughout the Gospel, Scripture plays an important role in telling us about the One who is the Way, the Truth and the Life. All through the Gospels, as all through the Bible, both the Old and New Testaments, the Scriptures play a key role in revealing truth. This is especially true when it comes to teaching us about who Jesus is and what he came to do. Read John chapter 5, verses 38 to 40. What is Jesus saying here about the Scriptures? John 5, beginning at verse 38. Nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the Scriptures diligently, because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very Scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Jesus and his disciples pointed to Scripture again and again to validate him as the Messiah. Christ said in John five forty six and 47, If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Read Luke. 24, verse 27. Why is it important that Jesus first pointed to the Scriptures in order to reveal the significance of his ministry? Luke 24, verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the Scriptures concerning himself. In another place, while quoting from the book of Exodus, Christ said in Matthew 22.31, Have you not read what was spoken to you by God? Zacharias referred to the promises of God in Luke 1.70 that he, God, spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the world began. In his sermon on the day of Pentecost, Peter said in Acts 1.16, This scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David. The Bible is not a textbook on science. It does not explain how to split the atom or perform brain surgery. But it does something even more significant. It provides the context within which our universe has meaning. It is the key that opens the door, the light that makes it possible to see. Without it, we would be in the dark about the existence of God, his role in the universe, our own origin, the meaning of life, and the future. And so to finish today, what are some truths taught in the Bible that science, even in theory, can never teach us? Friday. 
Friday, December 6, Further Thought When Jesus said, I am the light of the world, he was, as we read in The Desire of Ages, page 463 and 464, in the court of the temple, specially connected with the services of the Feast of Tabernacles. In the centre of this court rose two lofty standards, supporting lampstands of great size. After the evening sacrifice, all the lamps were kindled, shedding their light over Jerusalem. This ceremony was in commemoration of the pillar of light that guided Israel in the desert, and was also regarded as pointing to the coming of the Messiah. At evening, when the lamps were lighted, the court was a scene of great rejoicing. In the illumination of Jerusalem, the people expressed their hope of the Messiah's coming to shed his light upon Israel. But to Jesus, the scene had a wider meaning. As the radiant lamps of the temple lighted up all about them, so Christ, the source of spiritual life, illuminates the darkness of the world. Yet the symbol was imperfect. That great light, which his own hand had set in the heavens, was a truer representation of the glory of his mission. It was morning, the sun had just risen above the Mount of Olives, and its rays fell with dazzling brightness on the marble palaces, and lighted upon the gold of the temple walls, when Jesus, pointing to it, said, I am the light of the world. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, in class, talk about your answer to Thursday's final question. What crucial truths taught by the Bible could we never, even in principle, learn from science? For example, the cross, or the resurrection, or the second coming. What other important biblical truths must be revealed to us? Otherwise, we would never know them. And question two, think about the fall of Lucifer, a perfect being with so much intellectual knowledge of God and of what God is like, and yet, even with all that, he rebelled against him. What does this tell us about the reality of free will, the same free will that we have, and why, moment by moment, we need to choose to surrender that will to God? And reading our inside story, our mission story for this week is Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Gift to a Well-Dressed Woman by Andrew McChesney A well-dressed woman drove her car into the parking garage of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's Upper Magdalena Conference in Bogota, Colombia. Are you Christians? she asked the parking attendant. Yes, replied 52-year-old Reuben Campos. Which religion are you? she asked. We are Seventh-day Adventists, he said. Can we help you? Someone told me that Adventists don't like to help others, she said. Reuben was surprised. Let us help you, he said. We're ready to serve. The woman asked if she could park her car in the church parking garage. Her apartment was nearby, but it didn't have any parking and she didn't feel safe leaving her car in the street at night. Yes, you can park here, Reuben said. How much would it cost, she asked. It won't cost you anything, Reuben said. It will be our gift to you. Thank you, the woman explained. Can I give you a hug? That night, the woman left her car in the parking garage. She returned the next night. On the third night, she asked Reuben for a Bible. Then the two started studying the Bible. Reuben brought her a chair, and he sat in the booth as they studied. After a month, the woman said she wanted to introduce Reuben to her husband. She called from her cell phone. It's with him that I'm studying the Bible and I want to be baptised, she said. The woman's husband was a senior Colombian military officer and he was on a temporary assignment abroad. He told Reuben that he also wanted Bible studies. We can start when I return to Colombia, he said. Reuben may have seen the happiest parking attendant in Colombia when the woman was baptised in a Seventh-day Adventist church in Bogota. He is now waiting for her husband to return to the country for Bible studies. Jesus engaged in mission outreach by serving others. He said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve.
as in Matthew 20, verse 28, New King James Version. Reuben is seeking to follow his example. We can have an impact on many lives if we only serve, said Reuben, who has worked as a parking attendant for eight years. Somebody could come to you soon. You have to be ready to serve no matter who or where that person is. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering that helped two mission outreach projects in Colombia last quarter. Remember, God is always faithful.